And good evening, folks. Good morning, good afternoon, whatever time you choose to listen. As always, it's Sean the Fork Chop Forker, joined by Lon Strickler uh, here at Darker Day Studios, broadcasting from high atop the Pajama Factory in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. Lon, how are you doing tonight? Doing pretty good. Uh, showed out last night. I had about a foot of snow, but uh, everything's pretty good today. A foot of snow. That's incredible. I had nothing here, so I feel fortunate for once. Yeah. I'm sorry. You had to dig out. You had a busy day today. I'm sure that didn't make matters any easier. No, uh, we, we were in the hospital most of the day today, and it, you know the roads were not that great this morning, but uh looks pretty good now. Well, one thing you can always count on when you have something to do is bad weather. Absolutely. Yeah, that, there's no doubt about that. Never fails. Nope. Lon, we've had a busy week. Yeah, it has been somewhat of a busy week. And and we got an awful lot going on. I mean, aside from just, you know, things going on in the personal time. And again, I apologize for our lack of broadcast of the Crypto Anomaly show. We are still working hard on it, and I hope to get it up sometime this weekend. <laughs> and by getting it up, I mean the show. Uh, mm -hmm. Not anything that may need blue pill induction. So uh, we're doing okay there. Uh, again, though, busy week. Lon, you and I appeared on show notes with Shannon Legro Monday night. We had a pretty good time. Yeah, we did. It was a good show, I thought. Um seemed a lot of people liked it. Uh, it was pretty high on their ratings as well. I got a lot of feedback off of it, and I got, you know, I did get some stories because of it as well. Yeah, you were telling me you got some uh, reports coming in there. We're going to be, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to be investigating. I'm sure we'll have some. Uh, information on phantomsandmonsters.com. Of course, where you can find all the good stuff from Lon Strickler. The pulse of the paranormal, that's what we call him because of his ability to get the information and get it up uh, there for the masses to, to read. You you folks, the listeners, the readers, that's what we do these, uh, these shows for, and that's what Lon does the blog for, to get the paranormal out into the everyday life. Uh, but, yeah, we did the show with Shannon Lee Grow. And if you go to SasquatchChronicles.com, you can sign up and listen. Now, uh, I, I'm a member of SasquatchChronicles.com. I'm a big supporter of the program and the sub-programs they have going on uh, on that website. And uh, it's almost a network, Lon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it, it, and it's a well-done show as well. These folks really take their time, and they really care. Uh, about what they're putting out there and the shows are, are phenomenal i've been listening they had one on the other weekend with a hiker uh and his buddy that were followed uh by a sasquatch creature and it was a pretty compelling story and again i encourage you to go to sasquatchchronicles.com and sign up and not only can you hear lon and i's show from monday on the program show notes with shannon but you can also hear uh, all the other programming they have to offer which is is top notch in my opinion and you're talking to a guy that pretty much started sasquatch radio well, yeah, I uh, I was on actually I was on Sasquatch Chronicles, uh, I guess a couple of weeks after the uh, Monsters and Mysteries Sexual Monster thing was up. So yeah, I mean, I, I, and I like their format too. People calling in or they booking people that just talk spe specifically about uh, their encounters, and uh, it's pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, in fact, they had you talk about your encounter again on mm -hmm. uh, Monday, and I actually talked about my experience, which I don't talk about mm -hmm. too often, and uh, it was just a good program. I enjoyed it. Uh, from what I've been reading online, folks also seem to enjoy it. I don't do too many interviews myself, Lon, so it was a rare opportunity for me to be on the other side of the microphone. Yeah, well, you know, that may change. Maybe, you know, get more requests. You know me. I, I like to be the man asking the questions, not the one giving the answers. <laughs> But that's neither here nor there. But, uh, Lon, speaking of Monsters and Mysteries, you've got an upcoming appearance on M2 on March 18th. You're going to be talking about Mantis Man. And, folks, check your, lo your local listings on Destination America. Lon, why don't you talk about that for a couple moments? Well, you know, I, don't, I really don't know what is, they're going to put on the show. Um, you know, they did a lot of interviewing with me. I don't know how much is going to go on there. But basically, this was... Um, this was the ordeal of two actual two different encounters, and then another encounter. But the two uh, the two original encounters were two fishermen on um, uh, uh, Musconacong River up near a um, oh god what what was the town <laughs> I can forget it but anyway it was in New Jersey uh, 
Western New Jersey. And, uh, you know, they, they saw this whatever, well, a being or something, some type of uh, uh, mantis-looking, maybe locust-looking creature. And the thing disappeared on them after they had seen it. And the funny thing was, the one story, the one I had gotten was was a subsequent sighting. The original an original sighting came in after they read um, someone mentioned it on one of the forums in uh, in the you know one of the town forums. So uh, that's how that happened. So. Monsters and Mysteries got the interview from both of them, plus I got an interview from uh, a lady who, her and her husband, saw something similar as well at their mother's house. So, I don't know how long the segment's going to be. Normally, those segments run anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes, so I don't know how much it's going to be on there, but it's it's a real strange situation. Uh, normally, when you get the, you know these type of sightings, or any type of sighting, cryptid sighting, or even, you know, maybe it's a non-terrestrial. I don't know what this was. But to have three different people in a, the same area actually confirm it, uh, that's pretty interesting. It is. And, uh, you know, we've talked about the uh, mantis men in the past here. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, no real explanation for what they are behind them. Uh, I always, you know, jokingly call them the Zindi insectoids from uh, Enterprise. That's what they <laughs> remind me of. But... Uh, uh, folks are seeing them, Lon. You're reporting on it, and now it's going to be on Monsters and Mysteries in America again on March 18th. That's this month on the 18th. Check your local listings for showtime uh, on the channel Destination America. And they'll be talking about Mantis Man, the Spotsville Monster, and Tornado Phantoms, Lon, which is something that neither you or I yeah, that's are familiar something with. Yeah, that's new to me. I don't know what that's all about, but I guess I'll find out. <laughs> Well, when we watch the program, I guess we'll have to tune in and uh, and check it out a little bit so we can maybe talk about it in the future. Always learning yeah. new stuff every day here on uh, Arcane yeah. Radio. Uh, just every day, I guess every day in general, Lon, we're learning something new. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we do. It's exciting times. This is what we signed up for, though, when we did this. Oh. We said we, want, we wanted to explore the strange, the unusual, and the unknown, and by God are we getting it. Yeah, I, you know, of course, you know, all the stuff we do get, uh, you know, of course, the stuff I get, uh, it, it, nothing's the same. I mean, there's always some kind of caveat there that just sets it apart from everything else. But, uh, you know, this uh, this particular, like we were talking about this Mantis Man, this is, this is a real unusual one. And, uh, you know, possibly, and I'm hoping that, enough people watch it that it gets out there and maybe some other people will report it. We hope that's all we can ask for Lon. is we hope somebody gets in there and, mm-hmm. uh, and, and starts reporting, reporting these things. That's what we want. We want more mm-hmm. reports. Sure do. So Lon, I backed, I don't know if you're too familiar with, uh, our friend, Seth Breedlove, my friend, Seth Breedlove over there at the uh, Saswat, a podcast on Bigfoot. Uh-huh. He and the gentleman from Fathom Frontiers have put together a documentary, a little production company, Small Town Monsters, and they're doing a feature documentary on the Minerva Monster. Hmm. And Kickstarter was, uh, they had a uh, project on Kickstarter that I funded, so I'll be getting a, a little credit at the end of the movie and a package of goodies for kickstarting the project. Uh I'm excited about it. I can't wait to see it. It's all going to be talking about the Minerva monster flap in the 70s in the mm-hmm. small town of Minerva, Ohio. So uh, I'm anxious to see it. We'll get Seth on the show uh, to talk about it uh, so we can um, we can get folks uh, more tuned in and, and aware of the project so we can uh, give these guys some support. Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'd be happy to promote that over fans of monsters, no problem. Excellent. Well, I'll get him in touch with you so we can get uh, yeah. the ball rolling on, on some of that. A little late to the game, but I've been I, I've backed the project as soon as I found out about it. So I'm excited to see what's going to come to fruition with this uh, Minerva monster. I want to see that's going to premiere at the Ohio Bigfoot Conference, which I'll be at in May. So I'll be able to give a full recap on the program as well. If you go to the ForkChop.net, the ForkChop.net, my personal website. Uh, you'll be able to read reviews and commentary I have. And Lon and I are going to start adding some things to our 
we call it our uh, the Arcane Radio blog. Just adding some blurbs on there too, getting you guys kind of uh, abreast of what's going on and what's going on in our lives. I mean, Lon does a lot of. Uh, you do a lot of everyday uh, posting about uh, stories and encounters and everything you get, but folks really don't know a lot about us as people necessarily, a lot about us behind the scenes. So I thought it might be a good outlet for them to get to know us just a little bit. We'll po- post little fun topical things on there like Sean and Lon's favorite top ten this, so they get to know us a little bit. I think that'd be fun. Mm, okay. Yeah, that sounds cool. And if they don't like it too bad. <laughs> But, of course, you can go to our website, arcaneradio.com, and through the website you can like us on Twitter, Google+. Yes, people are still using Google+, and Facebook. And uh, I'm a social media uh, whore. Uh, I guess one would say I'm socially active. So uh, you can usually find me on social media at some point during the day. Uh, Speaking of social media and events, uh, the Paranormal Roundtable, coming up on April 18th, 2015, from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. at the Albertus Area Community Center, 220 West 2nd Street, Albertus, PA, uh, 18011. Uh, tickets are $15 online or $20 at the door. Uh, it's a paranormal round table. Uh, it's a round table discussion on ghosts, paranormal, cryptozoology, UFOs, and the, high, and the cases of high strangeness in Pennsylvania, and audience participation in open forum questions. Featuring Ghost Hunters Incorporated, the Keystone Bigfoot Project, Legend Hunters, Phantoms and Monsters, 14 Research, that's you and me, Lon, uh, UFO Research Center of Pennsylvania, uh, which is Butch Bukowski, our, uh, the man putting this on. He's a good guy. We, we like Butch a lot. Uh, tickets available at alhs18011.org. Credit cards are accepted. Limited supply of 300 people, Lon. Yeah, and I, I you know, I, and I have it. Well, I did talk to Butch a little bit, but he... Uh... He's been kind of out of touch. He had a death in the family not long ago, and, uh, you know, he's just trying to get back in order. But I I don't know how many have been sold so far. So uh, maybe we can get an update on that sometime soon. Uh, well, we hope to. Uh, kind of get the folks an idea of what's going to be going on, and uh, you and I get an idea of what's going on so we can be yeah. well prepared for this because, tentatively, you and I are both going to be there. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm excited about this, Lon. We don't do too much. In the world of uh, public uh, uh, events, and uh, uh, but we're starting to get there a little bit. You and I really, I mean, aside from interviews and everything, not really publicity whores. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say so. Though you know, I don't mind putting things up on Facebook and on the blog once in a while. But other than that, I'm not showing my face all over the place. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, aside from the you know couple interviews you do, I don't do yeah. too many interviews, and I and I haven't done TV. And you know me, I struggle with actually wanting to do TV. Uh-huh. So uh, this is our preferred medium, our radio show, where we kind of control the conversation and we get to talk about what uh, what's really important to us and uh, what's important to you, the listeners and folks. We always strive for. Uh, you know, bringing you the best show possible in terms of information and quality. So, as always, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, or ideas, send them to us. Arcane Radio. Uh, it's info at arcaneradio.com, info at arcaneradio.com. And I check that email every time it goes to my phone, So, which is quite often. So we get uh, updated frequently from what people want to hear, but we need you to start telling us so we can make the show better. Any input, Lon? <laughs> well, no, not really. You know, I, I, I did want to, I did want to mention uh, uh, a sighting report I did receive. Now, it's not a recent sighting report, but it was from someone who had heard the show we had with Shannon. And uh, as a result, I, I did receive a lot of inquiries and a few sighting accounts by email. But this one report in particular caught my attention, so I followed up on it. And uh, this is, uh, it's from uh, Lake Barkley, Kentucky, which is out in western Kentucky. She says, hi, Lon, I enjoyed the interview you, you and Sean gave with Shannon. I'm one of those eyewitnesses who has a refrain from talking about my sighting, but here it goes. I currently live in southern Illinois with my husband. I grew up in rural Lyon County, Kentucky, and a home in the woods and around the water. My dad and I spent many weekends fishing. One early April 2001 morning, when I was 14, 
we pulled the boat out of the slip. We pulled the boat out of the slip and headed south into Lake Barkley. It was an extremely overcast day with a heavy fog. In fact, we almost canceled that day. About an hour after we moved into the river, the sun broke through the clouds and the fog started to lift. So Dad said he wanted to try out the brush piles in one of the shallow bays off the land between the lakes area. Now, Dad pulled into one of the bays and dropped anchor. We then started fishing off the brush piles. I can remember that we were landing crappies and were having a very good morning. After an hour, things slowed down, so we decided to have some lunch. We sat in the boat eating about a, a hundred yard, excuse me, a hundred foot from shore. I think it was close to noon, but I'm not positive. We had finished eating and dad started to pull the anchor when we heard a loud splash. We looked towards the brush pile and again, there was a large and loud splash. Dad thought someone was throwing rocks, so he said that we needed to find another location. We started to pull off towards the main lake when I happened to catch a look at a man walking along the shore after it walked from behind the brush pile. Then I noticed that this was not a man because it had hair all over its entire body. It was a Bigfoot. I yelled at Dad, and he looked as I pointed towards it. He cut the motor off, and we sat there watching the Bigfoot throwing rocks into the water. It looked like it was trying to hit something. We watched for several minutes as the Bigfoot moved in and out of the brush on shore. Dad wanted to get closer so he could take a picture on his, on his phone, but I was scared and begged him to leave. The water was shallow, and I was afraid it would get mad and attack us. We tried to get a, he tried to get a photo, but for some reason the phone wasn't working correctly. We then cr noticed that there, were small, there was a smaller boat heading toward us. There was a man on, on the motor. As he came near, he cut the motor and looked towards the Bigfoot. He definitely saw it because he looked back at us with a surprised look on his face. Dad was alarmed and said that we were leaving. By that time, he was upset that someone else had seen us observing the Bigfoot. He recognized the man in the boat. My dad was well known in the area, and he was worried that would ha what would happen if his name was associated with a Bigfoot sighting. When we got home that evening, I told Mom what we saw. We told Mom what we saw. She was upset as well. That's as far as the story went. I was told to never tell anyone what we saw, had seen because it would create problems. I told the story to my husband not long after we were married. His reaction was favorable, and he has showed interest in what we saw. I guess we can refer to ourselves as Bigfoot enthusiasts. This is why we listened to you and Sean, because we were aware of your encounter and have listened to your podcast. And that's my story. I wish to remain anonymous, mostly because of my parents' fear of ridicule. Thanks for reading. So I got a hold of uh, her initial or DE. And I got a hold of DE. I contacted DE in order to get a description of the Bigfoot. She really didn't give me any description in the original letter. So um, she states that it was about six and a half to seven foot tall and very broad in the shoulders. The hair was very thick and dark brown. She could not estimate a weight. I asked if it was bipedal the entire time and she, that she observed it, which she acknowledged it was. Uh, she believes that they viewed the Bigfoot for almost 10 minutes, which, you know, I believe is a fairly remarkable long period of time. And uh, now I asked her if she was aware of the supernatural lore in the area, particularly the beast, the beast of the land between the lakes which is the uh, supposed canine cryptid that runs around in that area. And she, what, she didn't know anything about that. So, I don't know. I, you know. That's what I got from her. So, you know. It's interesting. Was she, they were on the water in a boat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, had, I had a Bigfoot sighting a few years ago up in Wisconsin uh from fishermen where they saw it on on the uh 
and that was actually, I think that was a, a group, a, a group of three that was seen. I forget the name of the lake, but, um, uh, yeah, this one and uh, this report and that report have been the only two I've ever received from people on a boat. I haven't heard too many, and they also described the uh, actual, um, oh, what am I trying, the activity of rock throwing at something in the water, probably mm-hmm. trying to fish or get something to eat. Possibly. Uh, definitely a good uh, a good uh, eyewitness report. Yeah, um, you know, that was, you know, what, 14 years ago. But still, uh, you know, it's uh, it, it's a pretty compelling report. Now, of course, we've all heard of the le- you know the legends of the area, uh, but you know she and she wasn't even aware of that. So you know, I don't know what that was all about. I thought everybody around there knew that story, but apparently she did. And so I don't think her parents were probably into the cryptid folklore that much they weren't happy about you know seeing that bigfoot so um yeah you know, so i can thing understand is, why it wasn't reported early with like people in that area though lon and people in some of these more rural communities uh, they don't like to talk about this stuff too often uh you know very conservative areas where they don't like to put their credibility on the line. And I think oftentimes we forget that. And that's why I'm glad we do Arcane Radio to get the word out there. And, you know, they have an outlet like Phantoms and Monsters to report this stuff to. Because who else are they going to talk to? You know what I mean? Where else is this information going to go besides nowhere? They're going to take it to the grave because they're not going to talk to their neighbors about it. Unless usually <laughs> someone sparks that conversation first. You know what I'm saying? Somebody yeah. somebody initiates, initiates that. And uh, I just wonder how many reports are out there that we don't have because of those attitudes. So the more we can provide something like this in an outlet, uh, I think it's a much greater service than what we uh, than what we think we're doing out here on the program and, and different avenues we have going. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. I do. I do agree with you because there is. Uh, it's like pulling teeth sometimes with people. You know, I. You know, they do get enough courage sometimes to give you a cursory report of something, but then they won't go beyond that. And, of course, they're not going to tell you who they are. So, you know, you get very little out of that, and, you know, then it's hard to even get anybody to believe what was going on. I mean, it's good for records, but other than that, it's not much to it. But, um, you know, that's why I try to follow up with people, because I never know what else I'm going to get out of them. Of course, this this report, I had to get a hold of her because she really didn't give me a description, and I wanted to see what she had to say. But, uh you know, that, that is a good thing about follow, trying to follow up because, uh, you know, you, you can find out other information, which is, you know, that's that's what investigating is all about. So, You know me. I don't like to miss opportunities like this when we don't mm-hmm. have to. When we have something we can jump on and talk to, and especially if it's in my area, I don't mind going out to, to check these things check these things out, get them going. I, we need these reports to keep the research fresh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, you know, actually, the reports coming into uh, PBS have been fairly steady. And, uh, you know, of course, you know, we get we get our, uh, an email when one comes in. Now, I'm not saying that all of them are the greatest, but, you know, they do we have been getting some decent reports. Oh, we have. Uh, Recently, we've been getting some good ones. And, and, you know, let's see if they come to fruition and and what comes of these uh, what comes of these things. At least we're taking the shots. You know what I mean? We're we're following up on what's coming out. And to me, that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. Just so much going on, uh, you know, with uh, uh, that 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 we investigate and follow up on specifically yourself. Um, have you heard anything up from our friends up in Canada about that habituation going on up there? No, uh, the gentleman hasn't contacted me lately. Uh, I, I know, I know he did have some medical issues at, at that time. So I don't know if, if that's, what's been going on. He was a regular listener to the other show. And I think that's the reason why he initially contacted me though. He did, um, he does get in fans of monsters as well, but, uh, I, you know, it, it, this may sound strange, but you know, the habituation was one thing and I, I did believe what he told me, but 
I think some of the UFO activity was more, you know, was more interesting. Uh, and just because, you know, we had the UFO activity and the habituation at the same time, I'm, I'm pretty sure there may have been, well, there may very well have been a connection. He had, um, he had been putting out trail cams and he had been picking up, um, uh, he'd been picking up, uh, images of something with hair trying to sneak a look into the trail cam a couple of times. Uh, it was hard to distinguish what it was because it was at night and of course there wasn't enough light. If this thing got too close to the lens, the hair was nothing that I had, I know of that was, you know, as far as an indigenous animal or, you know, in that area. So, you know, I had to, I had to send those over to you. I got a few of the, um, I got a few of the, uh, videos. Well, you know, what's some funny, of the hair is, it's pretty interesting to see. Uh, folks really liked your comment you made the other night about trail cams not picking up Bigfoot, but they sure always pick up the raccoon stealing the candy bar. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, folks really enjoyed that comment. There's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. But uh, we we got an interesting show coming up tonight, Lon. Uh, tonight's guests, uh, Dennis Carroll, uh, demonologist and cryptid researcher uh, from the – uh, Carolina Society for Paranormal Research and Investigations Incorporated. They're more than just ghost hunters. And uh, Dennis is going to be joining us. He's going to be talking about his upcoming episode on Ghost Asylum on Destination America. Uh, he's the co-author of The Road Unseen, A Paranormal Journey into High Strangeness. He's the co-host of Paranormal Shop Talk, and he's going to be on to talk to us tonight about what they do and uh, what he's been involved in. It's a new guest to us, so we're just excited as uh, anyone else to get started on this uh, on this show. And, uh, you know, Delon, we haven't really evolved into uh, demonology and, and that sort of stuff in a while. Yeah, you know, I, um, I do kind of get involved with it with clients once in a while, but, you know, I don't, you know, my... My uh, my uh, description of malevolency or evil, I don't like to really call it demonology or demons. Uh, I guess that, that's I think that's more of a religious, you know, a rel religious connotation for evil and malevolency. Uh, it's just plain evil, you know. And uh, there are different levels of evil and. Uh, in fact, I, I got somebody calling, I had somebody contact me today about shadow people and, uh, and it's something has been going on with the family for over 15 years. So that ought to be something, it'll be interesting. Those shadow people cases are, um, they're dangerous. They can be dangerous. And there have been some reports that people think that, you know, these things, these shadow people were, were responsible for. A death, especially when it's an older person or a young or a child, and uh, they they do seem to cause a lot of havoc. So you know, I, this is something new. This is something I'm going to be getting into. I've had other cases as well. So yeah, it's still be interesting talking to Dennis, and and uh, I don't know if his partner Brandon's going to be with him, but I'd like to you know see what he has to say about it. Yeah, I mean, they wrote the book. Uh... Again, The Road Unseen, A Paranormal Journey into High Strangeness, which I haven't read yet. I'm going to be quite transparent about it. I haven't read the uh, book yet, but it's definitely going to be on my list of uh, next reads. Speaking of list of reads, Lon, have you seen the latest from the uh, North American Wood Ape Conservancy? No, I haven't. The uh, monogram they just put out, and I'm going to get some information on that here real quick. North American Wood Ape. You can find them on uh, the book face, as my good friend Will Caps likes to call it, the mm -hmm. book face. Um, uh, it's called the uh, uh, Wachita Project. I believe I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, and it's there. Uh, it, it's long, too. So if you're looking for a Bigfoot book, <laughs> you can go on it. It's, a couple, it's uh, about 170 pages long, I think, Lon. Mm. And uh, it's... Really, it's probably one of the best papers I've read 
or I've started because I haven't finished it all yet. Uh, on documentation of what's going on in a Bigfoot research area. Of course, you know, they talk about Area X, which is an area they've done long-term study and investigations into. And, uh, you know, I really encourage folks to check it out and go to woodape.org, www.woodape.org, and check it out. Brian Brown, he's the uh, communications uh, spokesperson for the uh, North American Wood Ape Conservancy. And uh, he's been on, it was on I Doubt It, I mean, Doubtful News with, uh, oh, I can't ever remember her name. Sharon Hill. Sharon Hill, yeah. I'm sorry, Sharon, if you're listening to this, I apologize, I mean, to offend. Uh, you know, and say what you want about her. She's a little, uh, you know, she's a skeptic, you know what I mean? Which, you know, we toss that word around like it's dirty. It's not. I mean, I think it's all depending on the attitude that person carries with it. And she's given this a very a level and fair assessment. Uh, on this paper, which I appreciate, because you know me, Lon, that, that scientist in me, I, I like that fair and balanced, uh, fair and balanced uh, reporting, and I like the fair, fair and balanced reporting from actual researchers when they're putting stuff out there, saying this is the possibility, this is the documentation, this is what we have, this is what we think it is based upon those factors. Yeah, I mean, you know, I can't comment a whole lot on Sharon. She threw me off her website. I can't tell you that, but. Uh... <laughs> At least it wasn't off a bridge. <laughs> no. So, uh, but no, I I do read her, you know, I do read her column, her blog. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you got to be skeptic. You got to be skeptical about this anyway. I mean, that's that's the nature of the game. People who aren't skeptical and just take everything for, you know, as written, you know, are just getting themselves in a bind for, for the most part. So um, Themselves up for failure. That's yeah, right. you know, there's, there's no doubt about that. So, yeah, if you're, uh, if you're reporting on stuff, uh, you, you, you do have to take it with a grain of salt and have to check into it. Uh, you know, it may not be true, but if, if, you know, it, it, my motto is, it, you know, if they took the time to contact me and they continue to talk and they do believe they saw something, then I'm going to report it. And, uh, it would go from there. Uh, definitely. Uh-huh. But, you know, like I said, folks, if you're interested, go to woodape.org and check it out. It's right on the main page. Uh, and it's just, it's a great read. And I, I really think it's important for folks that are really serious about it to take a look. And uh, I'm going to be going into it a lot deeper. But I just really appreciate the uh, appreciate the efforts they put into it and being able to uh, read this uh, great piece of, uh, we'll call it great piece of research. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to look at that. And, you know, I'll actually put the link up to that on our page, so anybody who wants to go check it out, they can go and uh, go and see, and it shall be. You know, I haven't, re- you know, I haven't really read a, foot- a Bigfoot book in God knows how long. It's been a long time. I want to say the last book I actually read cover to cover was Tom Powell's The Locals. That, okay. was a, that was a good book, and, and it was very different because it explores different uh, possibilities for what the Bigfoot uh, may be. And, Lon, I think you'd like it because it expounds on some of those with different cases and studies and, and well, not studies, different cases and uh, witness reports and, uh, you know, opinion that Tom puts in there. But it's a really good book. It's one of my favorites. Of course, you know, we all know my favorite is uh, Sasquatch, the Apes Among Us. Huh? by john green that started it all for me but uh the tom powell's uh the locals is right up there is one of my favorite books and it's definitely worth folks checking out you can get that on amazon.com still good book he also wrote uh wrote another book after that regarding that i haven't read i think it's called shady neighbors it might be uh might be titled something else i hope it's shady neighbors uh but the book also from what i understand is uh that book's also pretty well uh, written. But The Locals is another one to check out, folks, if you're looking to read. So check out the monograph uh, monogram put out by the uh, Wood Ape Conservancy. Yeah, the monograph. I'm sorry. I'm butchering that <laughs> all the hell tonight. I haven't been drinking, folks, I promise. Uh, just a little iced tea here from the local McDonald's, which, you know, I really don't care for McDonald's, but it was in the neighborhood and I was thirsty and hungry. What you got to do on the fly. Lon, what, anything coming from Phantoms and Monsters this week that we can jaw jack about? Not really. Um, you know, I'm, normally most of the stuff comes in during the weekend. So um, right now, I don't know. I'm, you know, I don't have anything uh, 
sitting there waiting to go in. So uh, it'll all be by ear from now to Monday. Well, you know, I guess one thing we could report on that we didn't was the passing of Leonard Nimoy. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, I did write a little bit about that the other day, um, uh, well, especially with his involvement in in search of. And um, I wrote something about the Bigfoot episode. And, uh, you know, it was really the first thing that, you know, I knew about Bigfoot. But it was really the first time that, some of the evidence was put out there. Of course, John Green was on that show, and uh, Renee was on there, and some other people. And uh, it, you know, it was uh, it was just really talking about the Bigfoot in you know Pacific Northwest. But of course, since then, you know, Bigfoot's been reported worldwide. But you know, I, I just think that was the in, in the initial, the most important, maybe. Uh, documentary even though it was just a half hour documentary and uh kind of gave people a little idea of the science behind bigfoot you know lon it's you know i think about you know as a kid because you know two different generations you and i are you know actually almost three different generations but (laughs) between us but uh, you know literally speaking here uh, I grew up on syndication, you know, with uh, things like in search, you know, reruns. Mm-hmm. Uh, same with Star Trek. I grew up on reruns of those things. But, you know, as a kid, you know, and if folks read about me or listen to any of my other episodes, you'll know that things I, you know, attribute to my, my passion and my love of cryptozoology and what we do was in search of. As a kid growing up, it was on in the house uh, in search of unsolved mysteries, both Leonard and uh, Robert Stack are gone, <laughs> and those mm. are two voices I'm very familiar with uh, from my childhood that I really, uh, really enjoyed. And uh, you know, gentlemen, I aspired to be. I always wanted to host my own program about uh, the, the paranormal. <laughs> Alas, here I am. And uh, uh, but that was one thing I always wanted to do uh, growing up. So I always had a, a you know, I want to say a kinship with those guys because uh, what they did was cool at a time when you know those things still really weren't mainstream and you know i guess i have an appreciation of that besides you know my affinity for star trek i am a uh i won't, not, I won't say a lifelong star trek fan my uncle tom got me into it when i was like nine or ten years old so around the same time i started getting interested in the sasquatch and uh those things you know to explore and uh, or have always been kind of uh you know, a personal uh, credence and activity for me. You know, I like to explore. I like to discuss and travel and see new things and uh, have new experiences. And I really thank Leonard Nimoy for that because as a kid, you know, that voice resonated with the paranormal in my household. I grew up in those things. My grandfather, whose birthday was yesterday, happy birthday, Pa, uh, which I, uh, you know, put out there on the Facebook, shameless plugs. And, uh, you know, around his house growing up, he always had books about uh, strange journeys in the Amazon. Uh, he had us actually had a first edition book, Vincent Price Monsters, which a hardbound uh, was a hardbound book that I have in my possession now. It's really beaten up as a kid. I read that book and referred to it many times. I actually have it duct taped together, <laughs> so it's probably not worth anything. But the sentimental value on it. Uh, you know, that was the book my grandpa gave me, and uh, between that book and uh, Sasquatch the Apes Among Us and shows like In Search Of and Unsolved Mysteries and Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World, yeah, you know, those are shows that really got me hooked, and that's what, uh, you know, really prompted me to stay involved and to do this, and now here we are, Lon, with, you know, we were on Beyond the Edge, we have Arcane Radio, you know, those things that still I owe a great deal of thanks to Leonard Nimoy for. Yeah, you know, that that actual episode was first presented in uh, April 77, and that was about a year after I graduated from high school. And, you know, I had already been investigating a lot of locations in southern Pennsylvania, but that documentary really did open my eyes up to our mysterious and anomalous world. And, you know, then, of course, five years, four years later, I had my encounter in Sykesville and my world changed forever and I was hooked. You know, I, you know, I needed to find the truth out about Bigfoot and other cryptids. Uh, but you know, that show itself had, uh, you know, like I said, had John Green or Robert W. Morgan was in there. Sam Melville, uh, Renee was in it. Uh, it was, 
you know, it, it really was the, the the kind of thing that sparked uh, my interest in, you know, Bigfoot in general. But, you know, after seeing one, then I had to go look. <laughs> well, you know, and, and my story, you know, came just from reading the books and, and being involved and, and watching the TV programs. But they made a lasting impact on my life. And... Uh, you know, I don't know. You don't think about these things, and you don't really pay much attention until the people that inspire you, uh, those that inspire start to expire. And, yeah. and then you start thinking about things and putting things in perspective. And Absolutely. Yeah, it's sad, but, you know, as you know, my uh, mother-in-law pointed out, you know, he was 83. At some point, he <laughs> that, uh, that timetable was going to be up. Yeah. And, yeah. I yeah, saw he, was, uh, he was kind of looking rough anyway, and, you know, I know he had COPD, and, um, you know, he just another one of those, it's funny, it's funny people that you looked up to or people that were celebrities when you were a kid, of course, I'm dating myself, but, uh, you know, they're all going by the wayside now, and uh, it, it is kind of strange, it is. Who's going to replace them? You know what I mean? Those are just not iconic sure. people, but iconic voices, you know? Name another yeah. person that had a voice like Leonard Nimoy yeah. or a voice like Robert Stack. Yeah. Even, yeah, you know what I mean? Really. I always joke with my wife that if I want to get a voice like that, i got to drink more scotch and smoke more cigarettes. <laughs> of course, you know, I don't smoke, but the occasional cigar, and I'm not fond of drinking. But, you know, it's one of those, you know, those voices. You know, who else has a voice like that? And you know these guys you take it for granted but you know the you can almost close your eyes when you think about Bigfoot or or Loch Ness or Ogopogo and you can hear Leonard Nimoy talking about uh-huh. uh those things and he also narrated ancient mysteries uh segment on Bigfoot yeah yeah he did which is one of my favorite documentaries uh as well so i mean you know, just closing your eyes and think about resonating on these things yeah he was important to the world of star trek but really really important to the world outside of that two worlds that have really strong cult followings and really you know the world of star trek you know the trekkers and the trekkies out there and then you know the world of cryptozoology and the paranormal uh inspired by in search of and and shows like that man you know that's something special and uh we we are very thankful for those gentlemen and again close your eyes and you think about it those are the voices i hear right away in my head well you know rod serling actually was supposed to do that show but he passed away before the first season started because he had done um he had done specials the in search of ancient astronauts and the in search of uh ancient mysteries which aired prior to the regular nimoy series and, but rod serling passed away before that so then nimoy got the job and we caught we go from there well, you know, it's strange because I'm sitting here for the moment just writing down some names here quick, all right, uh-huh. of uh, gentlemen that I know have narrated different programs on cryptozoology. So you've got Leonard Nimoy, who's passed away. Uh-huh. Robert Stack has passed away. Peter Graves. Peter Graves. Passed away. Ed Herman. Most folks may know him from the show uh-huh. Gilmore Girls or some other projects, but he actually did a lot of narrating for Monster Quest. He's passed away. In fact, the He's only one away. I know who still is alive, Stacy Keach. Yep. Yes, he has. Uh, he did uh, Sasquatch Legend Meets Science. But, uh, you know, t- think about that now. Four iconic voices that, you know, you think about their names. You can hear their voices in your head. That's how powerful those voices are. And four of the five of those are now passed away. Yeah. Well, you know, also think about David Attenborough. He, you know. Alistair McLean, you know, they, they, they did mostly, uh, you know, maybe social documentaries, but they did a lot of, uh, nature documentaries and such. Of course, David Attenborough, uh, did a lot of the nature stuff and, you know, one of the most iconic voices as far as, uh, that goes. And, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it is. And, uh, you know, who's going to pick the ball up and run with it? I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you can really say they make documentaries like that anymore. They do make documentaries, of course. They make monsters and mysteries and a few other of these shows. But uh, you know, PBS still has some pretty good stuff, and uh, I do watch PBS a lot. 
Still do, even though there's a lot of cable, but I still watch PBS a lot. Well, like I said, let me get uh, some chain smoking going on and some scotch in my system, and <laughs> we'll see how I can go. All yeah. Right. Uh, let's two and one. Folks, you're listening to, again, Arcane Radio, Sean Forker, Lon Strickler, uh, and tonight's special guest we have joining us here via telephone, via Skype, is Mr. Dennis Carroll. Uh, Lon, you got a little bit there on Dennis to pull yeah, up. Yeah, Dennis I, is with yeah, Dennis is with the Carolina Society for Paranormal Research and Investigation Inc. Uh, they have one here that they're a nonprofit corporation that uses scientific principles to perform every investigation. We are also striving to further the field of paranormal investigation and research. Though all our investigations are performed with scientific protocol, we hold to Christian ideals and beliefs. Uh, CSPRI, Inc. was founded in February 29, 2012, and we have over a half a century of uh, paranormal research and investigation experience between all of our members. Now, uh, they're located in, they got two branch locations, one in Anderson County, South Carolina, and the surrounding counties in Charleston, South Carolina area and the surrounding counties. Um, so I'd like to welcome Dennis and uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be on. Um, like I said, I'm fans of you guys. I listen to your show a lot. Well, we appreciate that. Dennis, you're a demonologist. What does a, what does a demonologist do? Well, usually a demonologist is what I do mainly. I'm more or less sort of a uh, demonology consultant. Okay. Uh, I have uh, consulted with people all over the world about their problems and uh, a lot of their questions about demonology. Uh, I have got into demonology, um, like I say, uh, I've been in this field for 40 some odd years and almost from the beginning, demonology was a very... Uh, interesting aspect of it. Uh, you know, the paranormal field has many uh, smaller fields in it, uh, such as crypto uh, zoology and cryptid research or the old fashioned name for its monster hunting. I've done a lot of that. Uh, I've done a lot of ghost research or ghost hunting, as they call it. Uh, demonology to me was a very fascinating aspect because uh, at a very young age, um, I'm my research into this, my interest in this field, uh, took a 180-degree a angle turn when I actually saw um, demons. I saw two demons exit a man during a church service. And that got me interested in what uh, what this was, you know, what, what it was all about. I began to uh, study to get deeper into the subject of demonology, I uh, read a lot of the formalities uh, that were there, uh, a lot of the ancient books, and, of course, the Bible, which says a lot about it. Uh, that's a good, sort of a good textbook for it as well. Uh, I, I, I went to many different avenues looking for the answers that I saw and uh, for uh, the, the questions that haunted me. And, you know, um, I've said this to a lot of people. Whenever you have your first paranormal experience, uh, the first thing that always comes to your mind is nobody's going to believe it. <laughs> That's the first thing that pops in. And the, the second the second question that will haunt you probably for the rest of your life is what else is out there, mm-hmm. you know? And and to me, that, that is what really piques my curiosity into it. Um, and I began to study from that angle a lot of what was going on not just in ghost research, but like I said, of all the small fields of paranormal, I love them all. I don't want just one little piece of the pie. I want to sample the whole pie, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, to me, that, that is the interesting aspect of it all. And I've had a lot of members that, uh, in my group say, oh, I don't believe in Bigfoot, I don't believe in this. I said, well, no, you've got, to, you've got to research it all. That's what a true paranormal investigator does. He investigates anything having to do with the paranormal. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had an interesting incident last fall with a, uh, during a, a, a cryptid research session out in the woods of Oconee County, which are not far from Anderson, South Carolina, which is where I'm at. Um, and there had been a lot of sightings of Bigfoot up there. And uh, I was out there one night with a night scope and saw something. To this day, I can't really tell you what, what it really was. 
because unfortunately at that time I had the night scope off. You know, you know if you I know if you've had the experience of looking through a night scope, it will hurt your eyes after a while when you're in through and so I had it turned off and I was kinda of resting my eye and I put it back up and when I did I saw something move behind the tree and it looked honest to goodness more or less like to me like a a uh, um uh, elbow of this thing and went behind the tree. Well, you know, of course it could have been Rocky the flying squirrel too, for all I know. <laughs> because I've seen flying squirrels, they do operate at night as well. Mm -hmm. So, um I don't know what it really was. I didn't really if I had just raised my scope about a second or so sooner, I'd have got a better look at it. But it mm -hmm. just makes me want to see more of it. It makes me want to find out more about it. Uh, to me, that's the most interesting aspect of it all. Um, to me, that is what paranormal in investigation and research is all about, looking for those answers, seeking the truth on these things. Um, if, if what I saw was Bigfoot, I have to say this, if uh, it, knew it, I would have to say, almost disappeared supernaturally in front of me because I've hunted, I've done a lot of hunting. I've hunted deer, I've hunted... I've uh, been uh, coon hunting, I've done um, uh, squirrel hunting and all that. I was looking further deeper into the woods for it to move down through there, and there was no way it could have got away from me. It, it could have gotten away that quick. It was just like it was gone, almost supernaturally like. Yeah, and well, see, that I, I hear that a lot. I mean, I, I hear, you know, and you've read the blog, and I, I hear that a lot. Um, you yeah. know, it's there one minute and gone. If you're hunting and you're hunting for squirrel, coon, or whatever, they just don't disappear, but for whatever reason, you, you know, <laughs> these Bigfoot just have a tendency to just vanish. Yeah. and uh, you know, it, it is. It's it's it. You can't explain it. Yes, and I would definitely want to see more of it. Well, like you have with your experience, right. I would like to see all of it. I would, uh, you know, that would conclude it in my mind for me. You know, I told this to a lot of people. I, uh, the skeptic will immediately call you a liar, and I'm not that way. I'm not a skeptic. I have, I try to. Uh, approach it, although with a scientific slant, but with an open mind. Right. Uh, I don't think, you know, science is benefited by closed minds. Definitely not. Yeah. And um, uh, people are seeing something, you know. Um, and that's why I say I get a lot of photographs sent to me. Can you tell me what this is, what this is like? And I say, well, I don't know. I'd have to be there. I'd rather be there to see it, you know, myself, and that would conclude. And, uh, you had experienced in a, in a church or during a service uh, two demons leaving an individual. What uh, what was the circumstances behind that? And uh, have you have you the ability to see other entities as well? Okay, uh, well, uh, in the incident with the demons, uh, I was about probably uh, about 17 years old mm -hmm. uh, when that took place. I was during the church service. I began to pray for this man up front at the church. And uh, I was just sitting there watching, and I, it's kind of hard to describe this, but it was almost like two basketball-sized dirty white light. I said dirty white. They, were, they, were, they weren't a glowing bright, you know. They were like dirty balls of light okay. that came out of this man one at a time. There were two of them and went through a wall and disappeared. And I'm sitting there, like, you know, my jaw is on the floor and looking at this. And I'm saying, <laughs> yeah, I see what I saw just now. You know, it took me a while for my mind to comprehend what I actually saw. Right. Uh, you hear about these things, but until you actually see it, that's what, you know, Put the ice on your cake, down to speak, you know. Uh, to me, that made me say, what was that? And what is this? And what's going on here? And I want to know more, definitely. I want to know what, what this is. And see. Oh, well, something's going on. Really? <laughs> yes. Dennis? Oh, for the love of Pete. Mm. Oh, Christmas lawn. <laughs> I knew it was too good to be true. <laughs> okay. So we were talking about the church. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, like I said, when I saw those, uh, those uh, two lights like, come out of this man, they were like 
uh, dirty balls of light about basketball size, and they like came out one after the other out of this man and went through the wall. Like I say, I was sitting there, my my jaw was on the floor, and uh, I just couldn't believe what I saw. I mean, it took a long time for my mind to comprehend what I saw. Um, but that just began my kind of journey into demonology. I mean, I began to wonder what this was. Why it you know had it, it had these kind of properties to it? Uh, um, I had a lot of questions to which I had no answers, and I began to search in a lot of ancient books like uh, the Gemaras, the uh, uh, the books of Enoch, all and the Bible, of course, which is sort of a textbook to demonologists in, in a way. Uh, it does talk a lot about demons or these negative energies, as some people call them. Um, there was a, a question that confronted me back in my in my beginning the beginning days of my uh, career in the paranormal, and that was this: uh, cultures a world apart from each other. Why do they have the same things? Uh, in almost every culture, you found shapeshifters, you found vampires, you found ghosts, witches, monsters. What was going on here? You know, and the only reasonable explanation I could come up with to that. To that question was somebody somewhere must have seen something like this, you know, mm-hmm. uh, for this to be for this to become almost like a racial memory in many cultures. Uh, what's going on here? Like the dragon is found in every culture on this world. Why? What's going on with that? And yet science tells us that no men were living in the in the days of dinosaurs. I, I don't know about that because <laughs> it's just too prevalent. For it to be just imagination, you know what I mean? But uh, there were questions like that begin to haunt me. The more I looked into it, the more questions it raised. And somebody, uh, for me, uh, it was just like quicksand. The deeper I got into it, the deeper I got. And uh, it still is that way. Forty years later, uh, it, it still fascinates me. It hasn't gotten old. It never does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but now as for demons, um, after that incident, later on when I got deeper into demonology, I actually have seen demons several times since then, and they have manifested in different forms. I've even been uh, on several occasions attacked by these things. Uh, I think, and uh, just recently, in the last time I ran into one, I found out something about it that I never knew and hadn't read anywhere. And that was the fact that these things can, to a certain point, I believe, read your mind. They can use images. They can turn your mind against you in some ways. Uh, I think the images that are just floating on the surface of your conscious mind, I believe they can use these. They read these things. And uh, I found that out firsthand uh, the last time I actually ran into one of these things. Actually, I was in a room where this thing manifested itself as a shadow form that was probably, it was, a, it was a shadow darker than the darkness around it. It was probably around five foot by eight in that room, eight foot high. It was just like it was pulling in darkness to it. And, uh, and then that's when I saw very faint two red eyes in this darkness. And this thing began to advance toward me, and actually my uh, colleague Brandon Hudgens, he was in the room too. He was attacked by it. Emotionally, it attacked me physically. It was almost as if I were having a heart attack. Oh, really? All of a sudden, that. yeah, this thing again, the, the, the energy I would begin to go up my leg and up towards my chest, it was almost, I began to get short of breath almost. And it was uh, it was almost like it was, you know, uh, the signs of a pre-heart attack type thing. Um, finding when I rebuked this thing and got it off of me, um, only then I began to feel better, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, it took several days for Brandon to get over his attack because mm-hmm. uh, emotionally, it really did a job on him emotionally. These things will attack you basically in four different ways, uh, spiritually, mentally, physically, and emotionally. Uh, those are the, the four things that really make us who we are in many aspects. Mm-hmm. And uh, I tell this too, I also mention this to psychic people, people who have psychic abilities, to be careful because these negative energies can attack you psychically as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if Lyon's ever had that problem. Oh, yeah, uh, I've, had, uh, I've had psychic attacks 
uh, mm-hmm. during, uh, well, RVs, but I, I, I've had psychic attacks during sessions with mm-hmm. uh, clients. Oh, yeah, that's, uh, and I mean, some of them have been physical as well. Yeah, I've, I've showed these guys yeah. The marks, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's not, I mean, you got really yeah, you got to really, uh, you, you got to really be aware of it. I agree with that, and I tell anybody, you know, protect yourself. Absolutely, protect yourself before you get in this type of thing, because uh, oh, yeah. you never know what's going to happen to you. Oh yeah, and you know, and you know these things can sometimes even attach to you if you're not careful. Absolutely. Um, yeah, they can uh, form that kind of an attack. It's like that old saying, "Monkey on your back," kind of thing. <laughs> they can uh, do that. I've had a lot of cases with people who have actually these. Uh, negative energy type attachments to them, and they really make life terrible for these people. Uh, these things, these things, and, and I think I know Ron knows what I'm about to say. These things are opportunists. They take that opportunity, and if, if they get that opportunity, they'll definitely take it. Uh, I've seen that. I've seen that happen many times, and these things can manifest themselves in different ways. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, so you never know how they're going to come at you, but like Ron says, you can protect yourself. You can build that, that barrier up that will help you. And forewarned is for, you know, for harm kind of a thing, because, uh, if you know, know what you're dealing with or, or exactly what it is, that gives you a leg up on it, you know, uh, and it helps protect yourself. Um, what kind of uh, what, what, do you use, what do you use for deliverance or I don't know if you call it deliverance or exorcism? What do you use? What kind of uh, ritual do you use? Well, actually, uh, I do a lot of Judeo Christian. I have done uh, a lot. There's a certain thing you can do for people who are pagans. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there are for uh, as a matter of fact, I've even helped Hindu people who are Hindu. Uh, there's just whatever they're comfortable with. You know, is what's going to help them. You know what I'm saying? Whatever their their basically their basic belief is is mm-hmm. is what empowers them Absolutely. to a certain extent. Yeah, to form that bumper around them, to form that that uh, that light. You might want to say socket light, I think that uh, can be a bumper or armor, as the old saying used to be, armor. Uh, it just depends on who the individual is and what the case is. Uh, I don't actually do exorcisms. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I mainly, I mainly do uh, what we call location exorcisms or cleansings is what right. I basically call it. But now if it does run into something like an actual demonic possession, uh, then I think it's time for the, the real experts in that to take over. Uh, because, you know, there's so many different ramifications in that. It could be it could be mental illness. It could be a physical thing. It could be something besides that. But uh, here's one thing you got to think about. These negative energies are drawn to pain and suffering. Mm-hmm. They are drawn to, to mental um, um, anguish and mental suffering, just like any kind of mental illness, they're drawn to that. So you never know what it is you're really dealing with. You got to be very careful. You got to really understand what it is you're dealing with before you can call it for what you know you think it is. It's like a doctor diagnosing someone in a way, you know. And there are signs there. Uh, in the first book I wrote, that, that my partner and I wrote, it was called uh, Beyond the Shadows. I put a whole list in there of the, the signs of the demonic or evil negative, whatever, whatever name you want to give them. Um, I, a long list. And I've had a lot of people come and say, Mr. Carroll, I've got three of these on this list and I'm the best. <laughs> you know? I said, oh, no, no, that doesn't, these are just indicators. It doesn't actually mean that's what's going on. But it's just like, you know, if you sample the smoke, you know where it's coming from. Uh, there's got to be something going on there. And so if this is a lot of smoke, then you know there's a fire somewhere. Uh, so these are just indicators for people to understand. But now we have, uh, in this last book, uh, The Road Unseen, we have a hypothesis in there of what we call actually latent possession. Now you have uh, you have demonic influence, and then you have demonic oppression, and then demonic possession. We believe there may be a third, a third level in there, 
that is basically latent. But there's no words you're possessed, and you don't exhibit very many signs, and you don't even know it. It's nothing. It's nothing like a vampire and exorcist. There's no head going around. There's no pea soup being put up. It's a very, very, very subtle type of possession, and we think this may be what you see in the headlines of today a lot with these shootings and tragic things that go on in schools. It could be a lot of that could be. Actual aid in possession. You never know. Uh, we think that's out there, too. I don't know how prevalent it is. Nobody's ever done a study on it. This is just our theory that we come up with to explain a lot of things because a lot of times these people, after they've done these horrendous things, they come back and say, what did I do that for? You know, they're, they're like, what happened to me? Mm-hmm. It wasn't me that was driving a car anymore, you know. I went behind the wheel, so I well, so uh, there's got to be an explanation for some of this. It doesn't. It doesn't have to be a well. We can't paint it with a broad brush, but I think there are certain instances where this may occur. Um, how prevalent it is, I really don't know, but I think it's out there. And now, um, you had mentioned you, that. Yeah, you had mentioned in your bio to me that you you consulted on. Um, an incident that was on a show on uh, on Destination America. Can you exp- can you tell us about that? Uh, the the one I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't quite get that. What did you say? Okay, you, you mentioned you you had mentioned to me that you were uh, you consulted on a case that's going to be covered on one of the sh- one of the shows on Destination America. Uh, can you can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, oh yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's the uh, Ghost Asylum. Yeah. Um, show and um, they are actually I think called the Tennessee Race Chasers. Uh, yeah, their show is on the Destination Channel. They actually called me in a couple of weeks ago. They had an incident where uh, one of the members was sort of taken over by what I could turn as a sort of spirit of anger. Uh, and it was in a, uh, it was, I think, in a, uh, an, a, a deserted mental institute where this took place. Um, they uh, wanted to know what they could do to protect themselves a little more. And so I kind of advised them on that. Um, and like I you know, said previously, these, uh, these places seem to be uh, a hotbed for these negative energies, these evil type spirits. They seem to be drawn to these places where they're in like battlefields or... Or, uh, or hospitals and all that. They've known a lot of trauma and, and anguish and suffering and mental instability. These things seem to haunt these areas more than other places. Uh, that's why I warned them, and that's their specialty, by the way. They like to investigate uh, old hospitals and mental institutions and asylums. And uh, I warned them, you know, be careful because you can basically run into this. It's a little bit more pervaded than in other places. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you need to really go in and protect yourselves. Uh, we were a nice bunch of guys, and we really had a good rapport. And uh, I think it's going to be in, coming up on their next season when that's going to show. Uh, we shine on that, but it was a very, uh, it was a, uh, a very enjoyable uh, experience for me to be able to advise these people on that because they uh, are really. Uh, Messing around with something that you really got to be very careful yeah. with. What I mean, did you I'm advise them? How did you advise them to protect themselves? Well, uh, they protect themselves in different ways. Uh, and since they were rather religious, more Christian religious people, uh, I said that the best thing to do if you're going into these places, perhaps wear a blessed cross, uh, say a prayer before you go in, a prayer of protection. Uh, I gave them one of my favorites, this Romans in 13, 12. Uh, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. I like that one. That's a very, <laughs> that's a very good uh, description. And I said, what you've got to do, since you know they believe in God and, and they believe in faith, is that they have to enhance that and with their belief from deep down inside and support that armor that they can put on that spiritual armor like to protect themselves. I also advise them to carry holy water, perhaps, in there with them. Just a few of these things. And I told them, you can't put your faith in the things. 
it's the symbol that they stand for. That that's where your real faith goes in. Uh, what they stand for is just a way for them to focus their faith. And when you focus your faith, whatever it is you believe, uh, that enhances and makes you somewhat stronger psychically and spiritually uh, in order to face these things. Uh, a lot of times in my group, when we go in to investigate areas, we think that how these negative energies, we will say a prior protection going in and also coming out. So that we don't get any attachments, we don't ever want to bring home home with us, you know, from these places. We don't want anything to follow us back. Right. Uh, so you, you've got to keep that in mind because it is an occupational hazard when you do paranormal investigation. Um, you've got to bear that in mind that that's a risk that you run. Now, um, also in in this book that we got out here recently, the road unseen. We, uh, we also talk about high strangeness, which is another favorite subject of mine. Mm-hmm. Um, high strangeness, I've actually been touched with. As a matter of fact, I, I feel like for a while there I was reading the Mothman prophecies. <laughs> I feel like John Keel there for a while because I had a very dramatic UFO sighting. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, about, was about six or seven years ago. Uh, I was uptown. It was in the autumn. It was uh, late in the day. It was almost, almost dark. I had been walking a little route that I walked up there, you know, for exercise. And I come back to my car. I was standing there kind of cooling off. I was right there on the sidewalk. This is uptown now. So this is a mid-sized town here in Anderson. And uh, I was standing there just cooling off, kind of not even thinking about anything like this. And like I say, I've been interested in the paranormal all these years. And, and my attitude towards UFOs and people that saw them, I said, well, people were seeing something. But I thought most of the time it was something that could be explained. Mm-hmm. Uh, I knew there was a percentage of stuff that was unexplainable. I knew that. But until then, I'd never seen anything like this. But what I saw that day blew me away. It was even more dramatic to me than the demons that I saw. And uh, I have been privileged to see some paranormal things that some people go their whole lives and never see. But... Um, I don't know why, but that just happened to be in the right place at the right time. That's all I can say. I'm nobody special that way. I'm not psychic. I'm, uh, if I have psychic abilities, I don't know them. Mm-hmm. But um, I never explored that part of my. Um, but I think I think psychic abilities like are like talents. By the way, everybody's got some kind of gift, some kind of talent. You know. Um, but anyway, I was standing there cooling off, just kind of looking up at the sky, and even thinking about anything. And uh, the clouds were very low hanging that day, and that's why I was kind of looking up because you know low hanging clouds rain on you. And uh, I've been watching them all during my walk, and I had walked about an hour, and I was just standing there cooling off, looking up at these low hanging clouds, and I see through the clouds this shape coming coming from the horizon directly towards me. It is uh, back then it was a now sort of a classic triangular UFO. That's what it was. It was uh, black. It had no lights on it. There were no running lights of any kind. It was it was black, but it was sort of a dull black. It wasn't shiny, and it had like a platform hanging under it. Like, um, I, as a matter of fact, I drew a sketch of this thing. Mm. It was huge. I mean, football size, huge, and I could see it partially in and out of the clouds that were low hanging. It went directly over my head at a very fast speed. And, and I would have to say, estimating it as fast as it was moving, it had to be doing an excess of three, at least 300 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. And this thing was going over, and it was absolutely eerily silent. Mm-hmm. And like I say, that was a jaw-dropping moment. I was just standing there, and here's what I got. I mean, I had, a, I had a phone with a camera in my pocket and never once thought I think that I was trying to take a picture of this thing. I was just flabbergasted by this. Um, I went back. I remember going back and telling my uncle about it. You could see how shaken up I was. And he said, well, I don't know what you saw, but I know you must have experienced something, you know. And I told my brother who immediately didn't believe me. <laughs> but that's the first thing that always comes in your mind. Nobody's going to believe this. Right. You know? Right. But what, what the impression of it he gave me, and uh, to this day I have, it was very military looking. But yeah. who's military? I don't know. I, don't, I just don't see how we 
as human beings have that kind of technology. If we do, then well, um, that no, blows I, my I, mind. I you, yeah. this, this, is, this is something that fascinates me as well. Uh, mm-hmm. These, these t- triangular UFOs, and they normally have some size to them, uh, are seen, they're seen nationwide. And, mm-hmm. I mean, now, I don't know if there's some type of uh, disinformation where they're trying to get people to actually believe these are government somehow or, or you know, I don't know. But, you know, the explanation I keep getting from, and from people I know that are, are well-versed in UFOs, is that they believe that most of it is uh, our uh, test vehicles or yeah. some type to do with the government. And that very well may be true, but if it is, then there's a technology they're using that we know nothing about. Exactly right. I agree with that. And this was, uh, like I said, I have seen everything that man, that I know of, man has ever made to fly. And this was something completely different. And to be so, I mean, it raised the hairs on my neck. It was so eerily silent. Mm-hmm. And it was so swift and gone so quick. It was just something, and it caught me. I mean, it blindsided me. You know, you're not expecting anything like that. And it just, you know, like I say, it just bit my mind out of shape. I'm thinking, what, you know, what else is out there? You know, if this is yeah. here, if this is, I mean, I tell what else is going on in this world? And uh, to me, uh, this is another section of the paranormal high strangeness. And by the way, I define high strangeness as there's weird, and then there's really, really weird, and that's how right. it's uh, To me, and, and then things, here's, here's, here's what really happened, really was sort of the icing on the cake in this situation. After this happened, I made, matter of fact, I sent in a report to MUFON that never got anything back. I don't know if it got to him or not, but I sent a report in about it. Never heard that, unfortunately, that happens a lot. Yeah, and then I, I went and told a few people on the phone. I even told a few people. And here's what really, the really I'm around about this. All this is in the book. Um, I began to see a government car buzzing my house. Okay. A black, black unmarked van, actually. Uh, and it had government place. I mean, you can tell them. When you see them, you know what a government place looks like. Uh, it began to buzz my house on a regular basis. I began to get weird phone calls. Night and day, with, with with like weird metallic sound, and then like almost like robotic, and also I began to get calls that were like howling. But talking about demonic, they sounded better than demonic. It was like a howling wind on it or something. Um, I wish I had recorded some of these actually. And and one there was one instance. This really got me. Where it was like a garbled radio transmission that actually came in over my answering machine at that time. I never ever known that to happen. That was weird. And um and then uh, I have a dog and he barks at a certain way. I know somebody's outside. You know, it's not usually a cat or another dog out there. And one night he woke me up doing that and I found signs that someone had been in my yard. Mm-hmm. Now for what reason I don't know, moving around all this I wrote about in the book. Uh, these things began to sort of haunt me. This, this weird stuff. And I'm like, what's going on here? You know, what, it's just me. I'm not that important. Why they check it on me? And also, now listen to this. They began, the government car began to follow my partner, Brandon. Uh, my colleague, Brandon Hudgens, who uh, also I had told a lot about this. Mm-hmm. They began to shout at him, especially after we began writing this like, book. Um, they came back again. Uh, buzz in my house, and he saw them as well. So what's going on here? Why are we so important to someone that's watching us? You well, know? Well, you know, the, this is a story I hear countless times, and unfortunately it's happened to me twice. And uh, uh, for, for the most mundane things, even if it mm-hmm. is a UFO or something, somebody just sees a light in the sky for whatever reason, some of these reports or some of these sightings do spark something where they the, the either have somebody come to your place and want to be talking to you or they're following you around or they're monitoring the phones or whatever. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I hear this all the time. You know, I really do. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, it, it does mm-hmm. happen. Yeah. And uh, now that they've done return, it's not a van anymore. It's a black SUV. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
So, you know, I've seen almost like I'm beginning to live a monthly <laughs> prophecy to a certain extent. I can yeah. kind of understand why I killed it. But I, here's what I'll tell you. The only only thing left is for the men in black. And, I, and I'd like to issue an invitation to them right now. If you're listening, come see me. Let's <laughs> talk. <laughs> I'll be waiting. <laughs> yeah, just yeah, just him. Don't come here. <laughs> um, what, now you talk about you, you also do a lot of cryptid investigation, or you started cryptid invest. What other than Bigfoot? Is there something else that you've been interested in? Uh, well, like I can say I've been interested in cryptozoology a lot. There are uh, I also like the uh, Earth life anomalies. You know, like the Marfa lights. Mm-hmm. The Brown Mountain Lights, which is not very far from about, about a right. two-hour drive from my house. Uh, that's interesting to me. Uh, I love every aspect of the paranormal. You can't come up with one I don't like, and I haven't investigated. Uh, I, I love it all. It, to me, it's a uh, it's an all-consuming passion for me. Um, the, uh, the What's going on in this world, and... Um, that's why, I, well, if you look at that, I'm going to read you a little uh, excerpt from my book right quick here. And this okay. is the way I, I look at it here. There seem to be elements in this world that have no rhyme or reason in the execution of their actions. They hide always behind the veil of the unknown and play their little games with us, all the while laughing at our bafflements with sly grins as they twist us first one way, then another, feeding off of our doubts and fears always knowing how near impossible it is for us to pin them down. All of these things are but wares of masks. They are not really what they may appear to be, but it is the thing behind the mask that we as paranormal researchers are chiefly concerned with. So what is behind the mask? What's going on with all this stuff? To me, that's the big question. What is the one thing that I can find one day before I, I become part of the paranormal myself? Well, what can yeah. I, and it will answer a lot of this. You know what I'm saying? But don't, don't you think there? Not, not, this is something I think may may be actually what's going. On. Don't don't you think all this uh, these anomalies and uh, paranormal activity may have a connection altogether somehow? No, oh, yeah. I think I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. you you look at the big the, the, the Bigfoot sightings. You have UFO sightings simultaneous to those. Uh, people who have seen UFOs, now this didn't happen to me, but some people who have seen UFOs have poltergeist activity in their houses. Yeah. What's going on here? I mean, uh, and I kind of side. Back when I began my career, I studied uh, I studied. Uh, uh, Henry, uh, Henry Price. I studied uh, Edwin Henry Warren. Mm-hmm. I studied uh, with uh, uh, Hans Holzer, with John Keel, all these people. And John Keel, I think, came very close to a lot of answers uh, in his in his perspective on it. And he, towards the end, was tagging some of this as demon demonology stuff. You know, mm-hmm. uh, um, that makes me wonder about that too. I want to. I want to look deeper into that aspect. Could that possibly be uh, an answer for some of this? Like I said, you can't paint it all with the same brush, mm-hmm. but there has to be a common denominator somewhere, you know? Yeah, I, I agree there. I agree there. Uh, yeah, there's just too many too many instances where multiple uh, multiple paranormal or uh, anomalies take place, and... Uh, you know, and it's it, it's interesting because there just seems to be certain hot spots. You know, just like where you're from. Now, the, mm-hmm. the UFO activity in in coastal Carolina, coastal South mm-hmm. Carolina, has really been phenomenal for the last couple of years, uh, especially in the yes, area of Myrtle yeah. Beach and that area. And there's been a lot of weird things, and a little mm-hmm. bit of an inlet yeah. as well. And, and here's another thing: where I live in Anderson, which is right on the border, almost of Georgia and South Carolina. Um, one of the lake lines runs almost through the smack middle of this county. And I began to wonder why isn't that some of the weird stuff that's going on here? That couldn't be another explanation. Uh, you know, you know the theory about ley lines yeah. and uh, where they cross and intersect. Uh, I'm beginning to wonder if there's not something to that. Uh, uh, like you say, and I, here's what I teach a lot of my people in, in my group, you know, you got to look for the patterns. No, it's funny. Yeah, they it's, tell you something. 
it's funny, Dennis, that you talk about ley lines because one of my old research partners, Ernie Delp, mm -hmm. used to really, he, he firmly believed that there was a correlation between an increase in paranormal activities and, and, mm -hmm. and ley lines, you know, the natural formations of this earth and, and high deposits of quartz and those sort of things that are really kind mm -hmm. of a maybe a catalyst or, a you know, a natural storage device for some of this paranormal um, energy, for lack of a better term. I, I think so. I think so. It's a draw to it, as we say, kind of something like it's like a magnet, kind of a magnetic type property to it. It seems to draw paranormal activity like to it, uh, to me. I agree with that uh, to a certain extent. I think there is something there with that. And as the electromagnetic properties of the world surround us, uh, there's a tie in there with that as well. And there have been theories that uh, when the Earth was young, it was covered with a much denser electromagnetic field. That is why things lived longer and were uh, stronger in their content. Uh, they existed in a better uh, type of world that was different than it is now because of the electromagnetism. There's, there's some properties there that I think science seems to ignore electromagnetism for some reason to a certain extent. And I don't know why because there seems to be some answers there with that maybe, you know? I think electromagnetic pulses and electromagnetic fields I get I agree with you I don't think it's being explored enough I think in in the matter that maybe people tried to use it for ghost investigations I you know that, that may very well be true I don't you know I don't really know the correlation but you know I, I do know where there are known ley lines the um, and I have done this the measurements just go crazy. Uh -huh. And in fact, you go up and down the ley line, a known ley line, the and uh, like that, uh, people, people like jump it, huh? up and down a lot. It's it's yeah. it's never a steady yeah. reading. And I mentioned that also in my book about the thirty seventh parallel. You right. know, and that's goes across me. That's another interesting aspect. And if you look at the ley lines in connection with that thirty seventh parallel, you've got a lot of cross ones in there. Uh, to a certain extent, uh, I don't know what's going on with that either, but that is another interesting property as well. I'll tell you this that I have noted in some of my ghost research, and I've had this happen. I have broken open fresh batteries, put them in a device, walk in the room, and they completely drain. Mm -hmm. I've had people who have been attacked by so-called so demons that tell me later, oh, I feel completely drained, mm -hmm. you know. And I'd say, what's going on here? These things use energy to manifest whatever oh, it is yeah. they're doing. Absolutely. And, uh, and there you have, with a ley line, inherent higher field of electromagnetism. Would they not be drawn to something like that? Definitely. Well, they are. Yeah. I, think they, I think they are. I think, yeah. um, you know, I, I have talked to psychics and intuitives that tell me without a doubt they have seen spiritual activity high along mm -hmm. ley lines. They have actually seen they have actually seen entities moving along ley lines. Uh, and there are uh, supposed to be a lot of churches built along some of those lines. Too, I have aren't no doubt they? of that. I have no doubt of that. Uh, you, yeah. you go over, you go over to Great Britain, over well in in in, uh, in Wiltshire County, where they um, were. Uh, uh, oh God. Nothing. I, I just I just lost. I just forgot my train of thought right there for a second. Uh, Stonehenge, mm -hmm. where Stonehenge is at, uh, the, the, ley li the ley lines are intersect right at that area, and a lot of the um, a lot of the areas where the uh, where these these crop circles have been showing up are along mm -hmm. ley lines as well. Now, yeah. if, if that has to do, you know, I I myself yeah. don't believe the ley line activity has anything to do with UFOs, but I do believe. That has something to do with the uh, the electromagnetic uh, fields in, in the Earth itself. I think it's being manipulated somehow. And I'll tell you something else. And speaking of my own culture, I'm, I'm Scotch Irish. Uh, that race of people has been very close to the land, uh, very knowledgeable of the mystical properties of this world. Uh, I think a lot of other nationalities are the same way too. I'm not just singling them out. It's better than anybody else, but. They're one example, and um, 
I believe these people, especially the ancient peoples, knew a lot more and felt a lot more along these ley lines about them or knew more and knowledgeable about them than we are today, to mm-hmm. some extent. And I believe oh, yeah. that's what you're seeing here. Yeah, like with Stonehenge and some of these places here in America that have been built along these lines as well. I mean, you I, you got to ask that question. Uh, these people knew a little bit more or something than we do. Well, I think, I, I think, uh, yeah, I think modern man for the most part has lost a lot of that intuition. Uh, okay. like, I, I know Native Americans were more spiritual and could mm-hmm. detect these things, even, I mean, those before them. It just seems that, right. you know, if they needed it to survive well, for the most part. I mean, and, I, mean, uh, they, you know. I, I agree, I agree. And, you know, uh, these people were more sensitive in that aspect. I think as we uh, uh, we get older, we lose a lot of that sensitivity. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's why I use a dog sometimes in my investigations. Uh, they are very sensitive. I pay attention to what they say. For one reason, for one thing, a dog is not going to lie to you. He doesn't know how to lie. He just tells you what he perceives. Uh, to me, that's a pretty good indicator of something, you know. Uh, that's why I like to use them a lot on that. And uh, I pay attention to small children, too, who tell me things about that, because unless they've been exposed to a lot of stuff, and, uh, you know, the smaller they are, the least exposed they are, they uh, they don't tend to lie. They don't have an opinion like the dogs or cats. They don't have an opinion. They're not, they're, they're, their observation is not shaded by opinion, put it that way. And then these children are the same way. And I pay attention a lot to that because I can tell you things, you know, uh, about what's going on in that environment. And I believe these people were very sensitive to their environment as well. And I think we've lost a lot of that, definitely. Especially since the more civilized we have become, the more we lose that, I believe. Definitely. Dennis, tell folks a little bit about Paranormal Shop Talk and how they can listen to the program. Uh, the house bay things, you mean? Your radio show. Okay, the uh, the location of bay things. Well, uh, can you tell people how they can how they can get online to to listen to your radio show? Oh, oh okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, can, um, the uh, uh, the best way to look it up is called Carolina Radio. It's all like Carolina, but it's Carolina. Radio.com, and it's called uh, Sh- uh, Paranormal Shop Talk. Randy and I, we call it the fastest hour in Paranormal. We, we want to get you guys on there one day and talk with you. We just talk shop off the top of our heads. It has anything to do with the paranormal. Uh, it's a free, open kind of talk. We don't have any certain subject. And we just like to sit around, shoot the breeze for about an hour. And believe me, it is one of the fastest hours. It's an enjoyable thing. And uh, so we have that going. Uh, and like I said, we have the books here, uh, Beyond the Shadows, uh, a field guide to the paranormal. And we also have The Weathered Unseen, a paranormal journey into high strangeness. Uh, I've got a lot of examples. Of, some people say it's almost like an encyclopedia of high strangeness because I put a lot of examples in there of what that, what that makeup is on that. We have a lot of personal stories of our own and other people's. Uh, we have uh, some hypotheses that we look at, some conjectures we do on things. So it's a very interesting book. Uh, I say that once you've read this book, you probably won't look at this world the same way again. Because <laughs> it raises a lot of questions and a lot of, it gets you thinking a lot about some things. And I, that's why we wrote it. It's not only to be entertaining, but hopefully educational as well. Uh, that uh, can be found on Amazon. Just You can look it up by my name, Dennis Carroll, uh, or you can just look it up by the title, The Road Unseen. What's the, uh, what's the website? What's your uh, URL? Okay, your the website, website is the, the website. You can find our website at carolina, dot net. Okay. That's one word. And um, uh, we have a long title for our group, so that's why we kind of shorten it up. We'll right. make it a little more man. Yeah, but that's Carolina, it's P-R-I-dot-net. Definitely. And, and Dennis, thanks for joining us. We're just out of time tonight. We got to uh, wrap this up, but we want to have you on again sometime. show is very good. A uh, lot of good information, man. We can't thank you enough for coming on. Oh, yeah, I appreciate it. I enjoyed it. And, yeah, definitely I will be happy to talk with you again, all right? 
This is one of my favorite subjects. <laughs> well, we appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's good to good to get with you on it, and uh, you take care. You, you too, have a Dennis. Great weekend. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Dennis Carroll, folks, from Carolina.com. And I'll have the uh, website up on ArcaneRadio.com so we can get more about Dennis. Uh, quite a few books, actually, he has published, Lon. Yeah, and I see we're glad to have him on the program uh, tonight, albeit briefly, and some technical difficulty, but at last, it's done. Any final thoughts, Lon? Nothing I can think of. Just everybody have a great weekend, and we promise to get this stuff up as soon as possible. That's right, folks. And, and you've been listening to Arcane Radio. Uh, bye. <laughs> you've been listening to Arcane Radio. We'll see you next week.